been an interesting morning already. We are driving on the way to church today, and as we're driving just past the graveyard up here, some of you might have seen it if you're driving that way, I think Chester said he saw it too there. But uh, as I was driving up the street, I had this guy almost sideswipe up for Del and I, and the, and the kids when we were in the car, and uh, I watched him in my mirror, he, he began to cross all the way over to our lanes, and in, off of the curb, and then clipped the back end of this black uh, um, SUV, uh, BW SUV. And uh, I think he was, I don't know, maybe, just, just a guess, the fact that the other driver, one of the other guys was following him in a truck said at the light he was slumped over his wheel. My guess is that either he's really not feeling well or that he's been drinking too much. You know, so he made a big error this morning, didn't he? And the error of one individual has a huge effect on many people's lives. You see, the guy that he hit was was visibly shaken and, and was very, very, uh, you know, you just, you could just see him just quivering as he was standing there. And, and uh, he was, uh, I didn't go over to see the fellow in his car, I just gave my guy my name and just said, you know, um, you, and, and my number, just to, if you needed a witness. And uh, it's, it's interesting how one person's life can change the, the, a lot of people's lives. Ardell and I, a couple weeks ago, stopped at a red light. Doing what we're supposed to do, paying attention to the laws of the land, right? And out of the blue, five seconds later, our car was hit from behind, and they rode our car off for for, um, for us. And uh, our dad and I been sore now for a couple of weeks, or almost a month, I guess it's getting close to now already. And uh, our, our neck still hurt, our back still hurt. So the person, one individual, is not paying attention, not not listening, and following the laws of the land. You know, when things are going great, it is then that we can become, become, become very complacent. We get overconfident, we become prideful, we can, we can even take things for granted, can't we? You know, we, we start to do things that we might not have always done. We basically, we can fail. What is worse, though, is we can fail to follow what we know God has required of us to do. It's a very dangerous thing to get into as a church, as individuals. We get very comfortable with what's going on around us, and we get very comfortable with, with how the successes we might have been, been having, and how things have been going, and we start to think that we're able to do things ourselves, we, and we, we get ourselves, we start down a road that's very dangerous. In the book of Joshua that we've been studying over the last few weeks, in, up, up to chapter 6, we see that people are following after God. They go into the, they're across the Jordan River, and uh, Joshua is taking taking leadership as we saw in chapter 1, and they prepared to cross the Jordan, and they, they obeyed God's commands to follow Him. And as they cross over the Jordan, they actually cross another time, and they cross through water on dry land. And uh, it's an amazing story. Then they get where we were last week in chapter 6, and God says, Joshua, you take the people, and you're going to march around the city every day for six days, and on the seventh day you're going to march around the city seven times, and at the trumpet, and the blast of the trumpet, everybody's going to scream out or shout out to, to, to the, out loud out of, out with their voices, and, and the, you're going to take the city. They've seen victory. They've seen accomplishments. They've seen great things in their lives. counsel of God, and as God proclaims to them what they need to do next, they, they, they do exactly as they're told, and then they, and, and they do, and, they, and then what they see is great things accomplished through the acts of God. But, in the Bible, we, whenever we see a but, or, or things similar to that, we know things are going on, going south. But just as they seem to be on the right track, one bad apple spoils a lot. Have you ever been, uh, you know, Christmas time? I love, who doesn't love oranges, the mandarin oranges when they come in at Christmas time? And I always thought mandarin oranges came from Japan, but now it makes sense to me that they didn't come from Japan because they could, they could be called mandarin oranges if they're from Japan. But, anyways, so that's, that's, that's just, uh, I, since I've been at this church, it never, never even dawned on me, but, but uh, now I realize where they come from, and they come from, from a better place, right? They come from China. So, originally. So, but, but when you go in and get oranges, you notice people dig through the boxes to see and make sure there's no bad ones? 
Because one bad orange in the box can spoil a whole bunch of other ones. In fact, you know, as you take a box of oranges home around Christmas time, we used to only get them for about two weeks at Christmas. Now you get them from uh, early in the fall to after Christmas, or you can get them even now. But at one time, they were called Christmas oranges, and we would get Christmas oranges for about a, a two-week span, about uh, maybe a week or two before Christmas, and that was it. That was the only time we saw them. And they came in a lot bigger boxes and everything. But you know, you dig through those oranges, and you find that one bad orange. And that one bad orange, if you look at it, around that orange, it starts to affect the other ones. That one bad orange is going moldy and yucky and soft and disgusting and ugh. You know, you just think about how horrible they are. The, when it starts to sit next to the other ones, that mold and everything begins to, to creep over on the oranges around it. So one bad orange in the box affects, begins to affect all the oranges. And it's interesting in this, in this passage of scripture, we see that happening in, in the lives of the Israelites. Sin of one person has a way of affecting those around them. One person that gossips and backstabs can become poison to all those around them. I've seen it in churches where one person gets a hate on for the pastor and it cuts, it cuts the legs right under, from underneath the pastor. It becomes hurtful and the work comes to a grinding stop. When we were in Saskatoon, we saw this happen. One person began to think that because uh, of my family's history, that I shouldn't be in the ministry, and so she proceeded to go around behind our backs and spread the, these, these interesting stories about our family. You see, I have a grandfather who was a Jehovah Witness, and as, as a result of that, she, she figured that I need to go and take care of that, and, and, I, and because of my grandfather, I shouldn't be in the ministry. And then, on top of it all off, she found out that my other grandfather, my, my dad's side, was a Mason. And as a result of that, she even she, she got more bent on the fact that I shouldn't be pastoring that church and I shouldn't be in the ministry. And eventually that poison just spread and it spread and it spread. And the work that we saw happen came to grinding, grinding all. It was, it was a tough time for us, for my family, and for, for my ministry and, and everything. I, a lot of things happened after that point that that took me down a road that was very, very difficult to go and, and uh, almost took me right out of the ministry altogether. Or in another case, where people become competitive in church or, or in, around in families, they're willing to do anything to get their way. The end result is the church has lost its focus and its church that and that church can not be used by God very right? So it can happen in the church, it can happen in the lives of our families, it can happen with our friends, it can happen all around us. Sin in one person's life can destroy the relationships with each, with each other and with God. And this is exactly what happens in the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua, where we're going to be studying this morning. In the seventh chapter, we're going to, if you just turn your Bibles and you have one with you, and just open it to there, we're going to work our way through. We're not going to read the whole story to you. And, I don't want you to want to, you know I'm not a great reader, as you can tell over time, and, and I don't want to read the whole thing to you, but as we go through this chapter, we'll look, we're going to see some bits and pieces of how the sin of one individual can turn around and affect the whole nation of Israel, and as a result, get them off track of what God would have to do. Before we do that, though, let's begin with a word of prayer, and ask God just to guide our time this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we can have to sit, lift your name in praise and to worship you through songs, through worship, through reading the scripture. Now, Lord, we continue our time of worship by looking at, into your word and understanding better how you want to interact in our lives and our relationship with you. And so, Father, may we not forget that as the, as the word of God was written to, for people many years ago, it's also written for us today. So guide us now. Guide our hearts. Open our hearts to your message. Have us hear the words that we need to hear. And our Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing upon me this morning as I proclaim your word to your people. I pray for these things in your Son's precious name. Amen. Well, I want us to begin our look at this chapter of Scripture in Joshua chapter 7 by looking at verse 11 first. It's the curse that is here that we see the problem for the people of Israel. 
It's in the one, this one verse we begin to get a picture of how one individual, one can affect many other individuals. In verse 11 of chapter 7, we read this, Israel has sinned, the word of God says, they have violated my covenant, covenant that I appointed for them. They have taken some of what was set apart. They have stole, deceived, and put things with their own, put things with their own belongings. So what has, what was it that had been taken? Why was it such a big deal? Why was it so such that they, that, they, that this was, this became such a, a major factor? Well, it says in this passage of scripture that they broke covenant with me. They made a promise. Well, what's a covenant? A promise is a, is a relationship between two individuals that they promise to do something together. Often we talk about marriage as a marriage covenant. So that as the two people enter into this relationship of marriage, they covenant together to promise to, to love each other, to care for each other in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, and so on. It's a covenant they made together. The people of Israel and God have made a covenant. God covenant with them that uh, if you follow after me, if you hear my words, if you follow in my advice, if you take my word and make it a part of your life, then I will have a relationship with you and I will give you all that I promised. First, he promised to Abraham that you're, I'll make you a nation. And then we see that promise repeated after, time after time after time, even to the point where we get to Joshua and this book. So this is what is such a big deal. Breaking covenant is a, is a terrible thing. Especially when you break covenant with God, it creates lots of different issues. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1, it says, The Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. So in other words, they had gone into, jo into Jericho, they would taken everything, they would taken the city as God had promised, they had been able to conquer everything that was in there, yet, they didn't do everything as, as, as they were told to do. Continuing, it says, Achan, son of Carmel, son of Cabin, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of what was set apart, and the Lord's name burned against Israel. One man. Not the whole nation. One man. Took what's set apart for God. One man went his own way. One man decided that this part of the rules were not for me. One man said that I can do as I please. He said, when you go into Jericho, when you, after you've marched around the city for six days, 
And then on the seventh day, when you march around it after for seven times, on that seventh time, you're going to go in and you're going to destroy everything in the city except for Rahab and her fam and her family and those in her household. And you're going to take only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and it's going to be given to back to the Lord and put into the treasure of the Lord. Everything else is to be done and put away with. And don't take it into your own home. Don't take it for yourself. For if you take it for yourself, you will be destroyed, as well as the people of Israel that will be set apart for destruction. So one man sinned, one man took upon himself the idea, I don't have to do that, I can take it for myself. It's okay. I'm not, you know, he, he was willing to sacrifice so much for his own personal gain, for his own desires. God had a plan for conquest. And when we go against the word of God, we go against God. This is what, it, this is what sin is. It is more than just those things like living together before marriage, more than just than the, than homosexual relationship, more than murder, more than stealing. Sin is sin. Sin is going against what God has told us to do. So what are some things that God has told us to do? Well, those are some things that God has told us not to do. God also told us, honor your mother and father. God also told us, keep the Sabbath holy. Yes, Tim, are you honor your mother and father? Even though she just said no. I'm pretty sure she's talking to Austin. <laughs> it's true, though, right? These things are sin. If we don't honor our parents, if we don't um, honor God, if we don't do all the things that, that God's word commands us to do, that's going against God's commands. That's going against what He's covenanted with us to do. Sin is not doing as God has directed. Here, when one sin, one sin, it has a terrible effect on all the people of God. And I would contend that when one sins within the body of believers, when one, if one is blatantly sinning in our midst, it can have a huge effect on his church, on his body. Have you ever seen in a body? Now, if you look at Stephen tonight, today, his hand is taped up and. Stephen's doing some great, there's a lot of things, and I'm looking forward to maybe getting to see Stephen, Stephen fight, you know, and things like this. But anyway, but, but you, you can ask him, when you, when you hurt your finger, and he's hiding now, when you hurt your finger, it hurts all the, it has a big effect on your body. My sister, when she was, when, when she was younger, she had a beautiful voice, my oldest sister. Uh, out, of, out of five children, four, five, uh, four of us were, were very much involved in music. One, I don't know what happened to her. But the, my oldest sister, she had a, a fantastic voice. And one day, all of a sudden, her voice, she couldn't sing. And her vocal cords actually had become calloused and vocal modules. And it affected her whole life. Music was her life. It still is in lots of ways. She plays the piano for school things. She, she still, she's able to sing now, finally again. But those little calluses, those things on her throat, affected her, a lot of her life. In the body of believers, we're considered a body. When one thing affects, is affected, all the bodies affect. And we see this in this passage of Scripture. The cause that is clear is in verse 2 and 3 and verse 12. But we begin to see the sin, that it, how it has effect, its effect on the people. We see it clearly change their attitude towards their abilities. The first thing we see, though, is overconfidence. In verse 2 and 3, they scouted out the land. And without any consultation with God, any asking of God for, for help, any advice from Him, they decide how they will proceed. In verse 2 and 3, it says, Joshua sent from, from Jericho to Ai, sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth -Aven, east of Bethel, to, and told them, go up and scout the land. So the men went up and scouted up. Or A. After returning to Joshua, they reported to him, don't send all the people, but send about two or three thousand men to attack up. Since the people by are so few, don't wear out all our people there. Now this is a very subtle thing here. But what we see happen is the people of Israel have become overconfident. 
And I believe we can attribute it back to the sin of Achan. For what has happened in this passage of Scripture is that now, all of a sudden, out of the blue, the people of God, even Joshua, decide, we don't need to consult with God. We're just going to go in and scout the land, and we're going to take the land. And we don't even need as many people as we thought we'd need. We're just going to send in two or three thousand, and we're going to take the land. When sin enters the ranks of the people, a common thing happens. And it's sometimes we see it happen in the church and in our lives. We see it here when they are successful in the conquest of the promised land because of the activity of God and all, and all of a sudden they think they no longer need to include God. So I believe firmly in this passage of Scripture what we see is the overconfidence, the sin of overconfidence, or the sin of forgetting how we got here in the first place. If we were so successful, now when they prepare to move on, and now to do it without God. And when in reality, they were successful only because of God. In churches, it's very dangerous. That's a danger we got when we run into. We see a church grow. We see people being baptized. We see all these wonderful things happening. And then we get so overconfident that we figure, oh, we can just go out and we'll scout the land. And we're going to go into this area. And we're going to take this area. We don't need any extra help. It's a very dangerous area in our lives to get into. In verse 10 to 11, God told Israel that they had sinned. What was the cause of their failure? Disobedience. Which goes back to their overconfidence. It goes back to Achan. Israel had sinned. They had they become, they had, they, they had, had violated my covenant, it says, and I that I have appointed for them. It was the sin of one man, his disobedience, that could have brought down the entire nation. Now, how does this relate to us? How does it relate to you? How does it relate to your family or your situation, however you want to look at it? Well, I would say if we're holding on to sin in our lives, it can have a huge effect on us. It can have a huge effect on your friends, on your family, and for that matter, it can have a huge effect on our church. See, today people don't want to talk about sin and its effects. We want to ignore it altogether. We want to say, just become a Christian and all will be fine. But the reality is sin can and will destroy so much of what we hold so dear to God if we hang on to it. In Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 10, we read of a, a, a couple, a, a, a husband and wife. In verse 1 it says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his own wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it to, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from the field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your, in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a, and a great fear came on the whole on all who heard. The young men got up, wrapped his body, carried it out, and buried it. There was an interval, er, interval of about three hours, but then his wife came in, knowing not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her. Yes, she said. Or, did you sell the, the field for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, Why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband at, at, are at the door. They will carry you out. Instantly, she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in, they found, when they found her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Now, how does this relate to what, our, what we're talking about? Very much in, very, in a huge way. Like Achan, Ananias and Sapphira said, We'll keep a portion of us. Now, would it be wrong for them to keep a portion? Not necessarily. What was wrong was they came and they presented as if they, they were being so sacrificial, and so holy and spiritual, and they brought and dropped this offering at the feet of the disciples. And then they were caught in a lie. And they weren't willing to be honest. And as a result, sin has an effect. 
And I don't know if it was Ananias who decided to do this first, or this fire, but I get the impression that Ananias did. And as a result of his sin and his life, it affected his family, didn't it? In a very huge way. Sin destroyed this family. It can do the same for each of us if we desire to hold on to it. When we harbor sin in our hearts, we affect all those around us. The failure in our own lives touches the families, our families, and the church. Are we then left with a hope in the midst of failure? It has been said that it is bad to fall, the worst to wallow in. It is bad to fail, the worst to wallow in. I can picture, I get a picture in my mind. It's kind of like when I was a boy, we were up in Prince, in Prince uh, uh, River, East River rather area, and we were along the river and we were jumping in, in this in this puddle of mud for a while. And it was, we had a blast in it. And it was, it was great fun. And we would run up and down, up and down, the, up this beach. It was along the Peace River. And we'd run all the way, we get about 15, 20 feet away. And we'd run and we'd jump and we'd hit the, the mud. And it, it just, at first it started to soften up here up to your ankles. Then it would soften up a little bit more and it was up to your knees. And then it was up to your waist. And eventually we got this mud so soft, when you ran and jumped into it, it was up to your, up to your armpits. It was amazing. That was amazing. It was the most fun I, I, I ever recall as a teenage boy having. And uh, the great thing was that you, you, you know, you could. It, it was we had just a, it was a blast. I mean, it was just, but it, you were you were covered from head to toe with this mud, and you could see us. But when we got down that mud, if we wanted to get out of it, we had to reach up and get hold of somebody and allow them to pull us out. Now. If we liked it so much, we could have just wallowed in it, I guess. <coughs> we could have sat in the, in the mud, and we could have just stayed there, right? And uh, we could be there to this day. So we could, if we fail and, we, and falter, and then we, we get in trouble like that, what if, if, if we want to stay in it, it makes no sense, right? It would make no sense for us to, to stay in the mud. And it would be a very difficult thing to do. But we had to reach out and to. We had to reach out and we had to take hold of, of somebody's hand to pull us out. The cure for failure is very near. In verse 19 through 20 of, of, of Joshua chapter 7, we read, And so Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you have done. Did, 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 didn't, don't hide anything from me. Achan replied to Joshua, It's true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did. The first thing that must happen when we sin, if we want to, we want to deal with it, is we must confess. We must tell God what we've done. We must, we must be, be honest before Him. We must come clean before God. If we want to have any hope for cure, if we want to have any hope for being able to get, get through the difficulty, we have to be able to be honest before God. So often, as is, is the case here, we see something we want, and we want it. So we take it. And we know it's wrong, and we try to hide it. You see, Achan knew what he did was wrong. How do we know what that is? It is that he took it, and he took it into his tent, in the middle of his tent, and hid it, and buried it. Achan knew it was wrong. Why else would he have buried it? So God calls for us to confess our sins. God calls for us to be honest. It says in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, if we, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and truth is not in us. Honestly, it is a must if we wish to remain in close and good relationship with God, to be honest before God and confess our sins. God wants us to, wants to see, wants us to see sin as He sees it, as disobedience to Him. Joshua chapter 7, verse 25, we go on to read this. It says, Why have you troubled us? Today the Lord will trouble you. So Israel stoned them to death. They buried their bodies and threw the stones, the stones on them. With sin comes correction. And before you say this was a harsh, less, 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 harsh uh, punishment for Achan and his family for such a minor thing, he surely he could have just taken and given it back to God. But remember that this same God had sent His Son to deal with 
our sin through his death. Right? Verse 25 of this chapter, so we see the correction. This is God said in the beginning that sin brings death. Sin brought defeat in the life of Israel. Joshua and the people of Israel took Achan and his sons and had the stone him. Achan sinned. But tragic, uh, tragic consequences. Failure broke the heart of God to the point that He sent His Son into this world to go to a cross. What do we do when we fail? Thank you. 